y'all were on uh, module 9B. I do not, I didn't finish grading your quiz from last time. There were so many corrections I had to make. Yikes. Anyway, and then there, and I was going to hopefully finish them today, but I don't have them. I must have left them on my desk at home. I know I have them because I was grading them this morning. So I apologize for that. I'll have them for you next week. We are on 9B. Remember we talked about the types of beaches out there. We talked about rocky shores last time. We're going to talk about sandy and muddy shores this time. All right. little review here at the beginning. Our intertidal zone. Uh, in fact, uh, on last week's quiz, one of the hard parts, that bottom question in the box, you know, that had all that stuff in there, um, I turned that into a bonus question. So I gave you extra points for the things you did get correct on that. I didn't count off for the things you didn't get on that, if that makes sense. Okay, so you'll end up with just uh, extra credit on that. All right, so the intertidal zone, the IZ, upper intertidal zone organisms, which have limited water, include gastropods, which are snails, uh, crustaceans, which are crabs. I think this is just review, yes? Oh, you do have a link for it? Okay. So remember, this is the upper IZ. Is a, a, on high tide, they have water. At low tide, they don't. We have some uh, critters crawling around on the shore. Our middle intertidal zone region organisms would include uh, barnacles and mussels, ones that uh, need water more frequently but can hold water in them to, uh, to survive when at low, low tide. The lower intertidal zone organisms, which are always in water, sometimes deeper than other times, would be algae, fish, crustaceans, sea stars, urchins, and I'm going to add there, etc. Other creatures. I mean, because really, you can think about it, what comes to the beach? in the say knee high water. You could even find sharks and things like that coming that close in if they're small enough. region and we got there and our beautiful sandy beach was all rocky it was just like all washed away and so we're trying to make our way down to the beach you know and there's it's just not very it's not a very nice beach so we asked the people there are y'all gonna truck in some sand and put it in here and they said oh no need we came the next year it was a beautiful sandy beach again so it all had washed in so the stuff moves around but it's not crashing so think about those crashing waves when they hit the rocks and they they uh, splash up high and this kind of thing there's really no uh, opportunity for the stand to stay around. It's all going to be washed back out. But on a calmer area, where I have pretty good waves, it will leave the sand. If it's really calm, it'll leave muddy sediment there. Okay, the sand does shift around easily, making it difficult for plants to grow there because it's constantly moving. Uh, animals survive by burrowing into the sand or mud. They're called in fauna. Do you have a blank for in fauna? Think of in fauna in, in the dirt or sand. So these are uh, creatures 
that burrow into the sand or mud, things like sand dollars and sandworms. Now, we've already dissected a sandworm, yes? Right? Back in the beginning sometime. But this is where they, um, this is where they reside in the sandy intertidal zone region. Do those things I have underlined, is that something you're supposed to write? Just a blank you're filling in, or are you writing a lot more? It'd be nice if you just had to fill in a blank. I mean, we have a, like, three blank spaces for the differences between part of the sand and sandy and muddy substrate. Is that anything from this slide? The differences between the what found in them? Uh, Organisms? Particles found in Part. Oh, we're getting to that. All right, are we all good with Infauna? We got Infauna on there? Okay, there's a nice sandy beach. Beautiful, huh? <coughs> and what's that critter? Yeah, digging in, right? We'll, we'll look at those guys today. All right, sediment types. Open uh, Ocean sediments are made up of sand, silt, and clay. Silt and clay make mud. Uh, sediment types are the result of the movement of water, an area well protected from wave action will allow free, uh, fine particles to settle, not get washed out. Those are usually muddy, like the bay area. They're also usually a little bit stinky because in the muddy region, then the creatures are having their uh, bodily um, functions take place. They'll leave away wastes and they'll have like a sulfur kind of a smell, that kind of thing. Areas with more wave action and stronger currents have a uh, coarser sediments. That would be sand because the water moves the silt and clay away before it can settle. And very heavy wave action won't even let sand settle, so that's why we have rocky shores. So now I'm getting to what you need to know for your, is it a chart? Here's what I have. Our substrate would either be clay, silt, or sand. Our particle size of our clay, it's smallest. The silt is small but larger than clay, and the sand is the largest of the particles here. The texture, if we take the clay plus the silt together, we have mud. Silt is a little grainier. Sand is the most grainy texture. So I think, is that what you're supposed to be putting on these blanks? I think so. <coughs> oh yeah, I see your in fauna blank was after that. Sorry about that. So here's our sand, our clay, and our silt. Interestingly, the sand particles are the, I mean, excuse me, the clay particles are the smallest. So if we looked at our uh, piece of gravel, which you can hold in your hand, right? Piece of gravel, our sand, we know about that, a little grain of sand. Our silt is that little dot right there. Here, clay, you can't even see it on this scale. So now we take our sand and compare it right there. And you can see the difference there. Yes.
see comparisons with them too. So pebbles at the top, granules, here's coarse sand, medium sand, fine sand, silt, and clay. Alright, so depending on what beach, what beach you're on, we have different kinds of sand. Okay, so let's take a look at it. Have, have you ever been to the Florida beaches? Who's been to the Florida beaches? We call that sugar sand, right? It's sugar sand. And when you walk in it, it squeaks. Squeak, squeak. Right? It's, but it's so beautiful. Texas coast is more like, uh, actually more like this on the bottom left, yeah? Mm -hmm. Kind of gray, kind of eh, you know, so. Um, and, but we can see some really coarse sand. Some of the Hawaiian beaches have really coarse sand. You lay in the sand and you end up with like this all stuck on you, like large pieces of sand. It's, it's very strange. It was so big. Here you can see little shells and things in this one here, larger parts. Here's a medium grade here in the middle on the left. Um, check out that beach. That's a black sand beach. You know where that is? Hawaii. Hawaii. Now, why is it black sand? It's black sand because the rocks that are there came from a volcano. You've seen volcanic glass, the black lava type stuff, the black uh, obsidian. When it gets broken down into little pieces, we end up with black sand. So here's in the hand, somebody holding it in the hand right there, okay? And so there's this kind of this rule in Hawaii that you don't bring home the sand. And you definitely don't bring home a rock. It's like, what do they call it in Hawaii? It's bad luck is what it is. But they do not want you taking the rocks away from Hawaii. So I had my, one of my sons has a fish tank. And he said, oh, mom, what would be great in my fish tank would be a Hawaiian rock. I said, oh, no, can do. Can't do it. I don't know if they have rock shops in Hawaii. I don't know. Maybe they'll sell it to me. But anyway, I didn't steal any of the sand either. I did, however, it, I was in a different country. I was in Costa Rica, and there was a black sand beach there. And I brought some of that sand home because nobody told me about any restrictions. I don't believe in bad luck, but I just want to respect the traditions of Hawaii. Uh, this is also Hawaii. Check out this sand. Have you ever seen that, um, I'm going to turn the light so you can see better. Have you ever seen that kind of pumice stone that you put in the grill and it's a red, it's red? So can you tell that's a red bat beach? Here it is. Somebody saying, look at that. Isn't that beautiful? So that's also Hawaii. And I, I saw the red beach, but we didn't go down onto the red beach. See how small it is? I think that's a person. It's pretty, all the beaches are kind of little enclaves, they're little, little bays type of things. Okay, in fauna, organisms that live in or under the sediment, and uh, it's very different from rocky shores because shores, the sediment moves around by wave action. What are those critters? Sure. Yeah, but did you know that sand dollars do like to live in, in big colonies? And sometimes you can find them all lined up, you know, like, like you've got coins stacked. They're all stacked sideways. It's pretty cool looking. But people don't go there because otherwise they'd be stepped upon and that kind of thing. So they wouldn't uh, do it there. But those are a bunch of sand dollars. All right, another one that lives in this area, of course, are the horseshoe crabs. We've already looked at a horseshoe crab. We did a quote-unquote dissection of it by just looking at its pretty much external anatomy, right? And it had those really cool book lungs underneath. Remember the legs and the book lungs were under here. I think I'll show it again. All right. And once again, there's the book lungs, excuse me, book gills. I keep calling them lungs, they're gills. Um, and I want to talk about them a little bit because it turns out that we use the horseshoe crabs for uh, medical purposes. They have blue blood. All right, so the chemical in our blood that makes it red is called hemoglobin. And these creatures have a chemical that in their blood that holds on to the oxygen that's not hemoglobin, it's a different chemical. And we have discovered that we can actually use that uh, for medicines for people with uh, blood disorders. Let's re uh, watch a video about it. During the warmer months, especially at night during the full moon, horseshoe crabs emerge from the sea to spawn. Waiting for them are teams of lab workers who capture the horseshoe crabs by the hundreds of thousands, take them to labs, harvest their cerulean blood, then return them to the sea. Oddly enough, 
We capture horseshoe crabs on the beach because that's the only place we know we can find them. A female horseshoe crab lays as many as 20 batches of up to 4,000 eggs on her annual visit to the beach. When the eggs hatch, the juvenile horseshoe crabs often stay near shore, periodically shedding their shells as they grow. Once they leave these shallow waters, they don't return until they reach sexual maturity 10 years later. Despite our best efforts, we don't know where they spend those years. Though we've spotted the occasional horseshoe crab as deep as 200 meters below the ocean's surface, we only see large groups of adults when they come ashore to spawn. Horseshoe crab blood contains cells called amoebocytes that protect them from infection by viruses, fungi, and bacteria. Amoebocytes form gels around these invaders to prevent them from spreading infections. This isn't unusual. All animals have protective immune systems, but horseshoe crab amoebocytes are exceptionally sensitive to bacterial endotoxins. Endotoxins are molecules from the cell walls of certain bacteria, including E. coli. Large amounts of them are released when bacterial cells die, and they can make us sick if they enter the bloodstream. Many of the medicines and medical devices we rely on can become contaminated, so we have to test them before they touch our blood. We do have tests called gram stains that detect bacteria, but they can't recognize endotoxins which can be there even when bacteria aren't present. So scientists use an extract called LAL, produced from harvested horseshoe crab blood, to test for endotoxins. They add LAL to a medicine sample, and if gels form, bacterial endotoxins are present. Today, the LAL test is used so widely that millions of people who've never seen a horseshoe crab have been protected by their blood. If you've ever had an injection, that probably includes you. Hmm. How did horseshoe crabs end up with such special blood? Like other invertebrates, the horseshoe crab has an open circulatory system. This means their blood isn't contained in blood vessels like ours. Instead, horseshoe crab blood flows freely through the body cavity and comes in direct contact with tissues. If bacteria enters their blood, it can quickly spread over a large area. Pair this vulnerability with the horseshoe crab's bacteria-filled ocean and shoreline habitats, and it's easy to see why they need such a sensitive immune response. Horseshoe crabs survived mass extinction events that wiped out over 90% of life on Earth and killed off the dinosaurs. But they're not invincible, and the biggest disruptions they've faced in millions of years come from us. Studies have shown that up to 15% of horseshoe crabs die in the process of having their blood harvested, and recent research suggests this number may be even higher. Researchers have also observed fewer females returning to spawn at some of the most harvested areas. Our impact on horseshoe crabs extends beyond the biomedical industry, too. Coastal development destroys spawning sites, and horseshoe crabs are also killed for fishing bait. There's ample evidence that their populations are shrinking. Some researchers have started working to synthesize horseshoe crab blood in the lab. For now, we're unlikely to stop our beach trips, but hopefully a synthetic alternative will someday eliminate our reliance on the blood of these ancient creatures. TED-Ed is a nonprofit and- Okay, so, like, no duh, that they're gonna die when you drain their blood out of them, right? So, yikes. Uh, it seems like that LAL could be produced in some way, so, uh, but it's interesting how we're still relying on such a low-tech thing, right, to do high-tech surgeries and that kind of thing. Interesting. Um, that one we had, remember the one we had that was big? So, I, and I wonder, maybe it was one that died during the process, maybe, and they used it for science? I don't know. I don't know. I hope they didn't take it, you know. Um, most, uh, most in fauna live near the substrate surface to get oxygen and they eat mostly detritus that's your blank there what do they eat detritus remember what detritus is it's dead organic material um and the creatures that live in it as well okay so that's what most of them eat including that little critter we're looking at right there we're going to be talking about 
uh, mud survival or with a little video we're going to watch. Oops, sorry. Okay. <clears throat> you got the detritus? You're, okay. Um, so here we're looking at, so a uh, general food web for the mudflats, okay? So we have clams and worms that are eating detritus, bacteria, plankton. So detritus and the stuff that lives in it. Copepods will be the smaller versions of clams, basically. And then the salmon, the small salmon will eat those. The gulls and shorebirds, ducks, other birds will eat the clams and worms. And flatfish will eat those as well. So there's kind of our, um, our food web. So what do they eat in the mudflats? They eat detritus, but they become food for other creatures that come to the mudflats to find them. All right, the muddy intertidal zone. Uh, detritus is found in areas with finer sediments where the current is not so strong because they don't get washed out, okay? Now, because the mud is so small and it, 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 they're like little flat pieces of paper, really, that fit on top of each other, there's less oxygen there. Okay, so there's not much oxygen in the mud flats because it's just so um, com uh, compressed there. So decomposition of the organic material takes place due to anaerobic conditions, so no oxygen conditions, low O2 levels, making the smell stinky. So what does it smell like? Stinky. We have sulfur, we have carbon dioxide, dioxide gas, we have methane, CH4, all those things that are kind of stinky smelling. So that's your answer for oxygen levels are low. Why does it smell? Because it's making these gases. And we'll get to our mud and fauna here in a second. But my next couple of slides have to do with sand. So I'm not sure if I have them out of order. I thought they had something to do with your book, but it doesn't look like it. So they're somewhat out of order. Okay, we got our CO2, our sulfur, and that kind of thing in there. Okay. So do you have the, the word indicator species anywhere in there? In your book? Indicator species? No? Um, the indicator species of the zone, which is sandy zone, are sandworms. Uh, they're indicator species for the sandy and muddy substrate. They can live in the mud. They're an important part of the ecosystem and the food web. We dissected these guys earlier in the year, remember? With their funny little frilly legs there. Uh, and our sandy beach, so, oh, is this that bottom box maybe? Okay, what is under the sand? The zonation of a sandy beach. That's why I have it here, because we're not done with the mud yet. I'm gonna go back to the mud. I'm not sure why I have it in this order. Okay, so here we go at low tide. Low tide's gonna be about right here. High tide's gonna be about right to the top of this piece right here. Okay. So what do we have down in the lowest areas? We have oh, a sea cucumber, blue crab. These are digging in right there in fauna. Sand dollars, uh, cock, uh, cockles. What kind of worm is that? Lugworm, longworm, some shrimp, some arthropods. On top we have some bristle worms, some crabs, some clams that are near the top to get to the food, right? A flounder, remember flounder's flat and kind of hides itself in the, uh, in the sand. Okay, and then we have something called the olive shell. So this is some of that zone. I think I just right, kind of draw this little incline on there and just draw a few of these creatures. Or not draw, draw, draw them, just name them in there. But if we missed a mud one, we're going back to mud. ocean crab versus the land crab which crawls around on the sand. So you don't have to put all those guys on there. Just keep in mind, remember at the high tide, they're gonna, um, well, excuse me, at the low tide, they're gonna be some that are exposed to air.
Hmm? I think it says lugworm or lungworm. It says lug, lugworm. They're harder to see up on the big screen. They look good on the showing these are in fauna. They're digging down and these are on top. <clears throat> but although the flounder does cover himself up. All right, back to our mud. <clears throat> Here's a mud flat. We can see that uh, frequently where a river dumps into the sea. Does anybody know what river that is? That is the Nile, the Nile River. And this is called the River Delta, the Nile Delta right here. So we have a lot of mud flats here washing down very, very uh, nutritious mud from, you know, it's flowing upward. The Nile floats upward, and it, uh, runs upward, and it's bringing all these nutrients from way down in Africa. Uh, we can see some muddy flats right there. So it's nice and calm, and there's still tide there, so it still comes in. Let's take a little, uh, let's watch a little video. And where better to start than a muddy shoreline in Japan? Mudskippers look like creatures that began to evolve from the sea to the land and then got stuck halfway. A fish that can live out of water. Although trying to walk around on fins doesn't make it look like they've cracked it quite yet. Survival is tough enough as it is, so there must be a good reason to add an extra degree of difficulty. Well, it's all about the mud. Though it may not look appetizing, mud skippers eat and thrive on mud. It's rich in tiny plants and animals, which they filter out. got a neat trick to enable them to survive out of water. To breathe on land, mud skippers store water in their cheeks surrounding their gills. Every now and then, topping up the oxygen levels in the water with a big gulp of air. They're not breathing the air directly. The air they're gulping in mixes with the water around their gills, allowing them to draw out the oxygen as though they were underwater. And they're also able to breathe directly through their skin. But being a fish, and a tropical fish at that, they're taking a big risk. Drying out is their biggest danger. Only when their skin's wet can they breathe through it. If it dries out, they will quickly suffocate. So they're constantly rolling around in the mud to keep their skin moist. Skippers do seem to be rather disagreeable creatures. But perhaps it's a result of having to eat mud every day.
our next. All right, our mud skipper. Very cool. The next uh, crater we're going to look at from the muddy regions uh, and sandy regions would be the sand dollar. All right, we're going to watch a little video on these guys. What I have here is a live sand dollar. Now, you might be used to what a dead sand dollar looks like, so I'm just going to put this guy down for a minute and pick up a dead one that I actually have found here. So this is a dead sand dollar. Sometimes these will be quite white. Sometimes they'll be covered in seaweed, like you can see just the top of this one is. And often you'll be able to clearly see a set of grooves and an opening at the bottom. All of this tells me that this is a dead sand dollar. Now, if I go back to our live sand dollar, things are a little bit different. These are often quite dark in color, almost a black purple. You can still sort of see that outline of almost a flower on their back. Um, but the underneath side of them, so you don't actually see that opening the same way. If you take a really close look, you can actually see the bristles are moving. What these sand dollars actually eat is microscopic organisms floating in the water. Um, so that's why they have all these fine, fine bristles. They'll actually catch this plankton, move it with their bristles towards the center, which is where their mouth is, and then consume it that way. All right. So the sand dollar anatomy, this is our dissection today. All right. We have not dissected a sea urchin, right? Not yet? We will, but we haven't yet. OK. All right, so we, we know pretty much their anatomy. We have these at the Texas coast. So we see these, typically we see them when they're already dead, right? But you can see they have that sort of, it's interesting. Uh, what's my next picture? Okay, okay shh. so they have what are known as bristles on them. Like basically like they're in the, they're in the group Echinodermata, right? So they have spiny skin. So those little bristles are little spines on there, but they also have tube feet, like, this, like the uh, sea star, right? And so up here on the top, they have some tube feet in this. That's what's making this flower kind of structure right there. Along the edges are tube feet. And those tube feet are there for moving the water around. <coughs> they have that madparite thing, that madparite, on the top, just like a sea, dog, uh, sea star. Underneath is the opening for their mouth. So this is called the um, aberral side, and this is the oral side. And right here is where their mouth is. And those food grooves. Along the grooves, once again, two feet. All right, we may or may not be able to see the difference between the spines and the two feet, okay? They actually use the spines to move and the two feet to pull the water toward the mouth area. So they have separate um, uh, functions right there. Also, they take into the mouth, and you remember on the uh, sand all of the madparite and the, uh, the anus was toward the top. It's different on these guys. We'll find a little bit of a, uh, spot on one of the edges when we get it out and, and that's going to be where they excrete their wastes. Now inside their mouth, notice we have a star here as well, inside their mouth uh, is the mouth parts which is the most fascinating part of this dissection and we're going to see because it looks like this, okay, they have four or five teeth and when we pull those out that's known as Aristotle's lantern because it looks a little bit like a lantern. We're going to try to get it out whole so you can see that and then take the teeth apart, okay? Um, this is the same type of anatomy that we'll find in the sea urchin. It's just the urchin is big and has more room for, for stuff inside. These guys are flat, so they have very little room inside of it for body, bodily um, uh, structures, all right? Because they live under the sand, so they're, they're always flattening themselves. All right, so uh, there's a story that's come up about this called the legend of the sand dollar. Um, it says it's shell, it, it, it is considered a shell that it makes on the outside of it. We call it a test, just like we would do on the urchin, and, uh, and it's made here. So when we see it without any of its spines or tube feet, we see it looks white. It's been bleached out. Typically, it, it means it's dead, for one. Remember, if you find live ones, they'll crawl away, right? Uh, if you find the bleached ones, that means they've been dead for a while. Okay. Um, and so we can see here the five slits on the edge represent the five wounds of the body of Christ. So people use this as to tell the story of Jesus, okay? There's an Easter lily design on the top right here, 
with five pointed star. We'll see if ours, not every sand dollar has each one of these attributes. So we'll see what ours looks like if it happens. Uh, on the back is a uh, poinsettia, it says here, the Christmas flower. When the shell's broken open, well, you can shake it when they're dried and dead and hear something shaking in there. What you hear shaking in there are their teeth. Okay, those are the teeth that are shaking around in there. And so when you uh, pull them out, then they, the teeth look like this. They call it the doves of peace. Before you take them apart, they look like this, the Star of Bethlehem. If you want to use this as an example to tell somebody the gospel of Jesus, that's pretty cool to do that. But it's just the way God wanted them to look. So we can, you know, see what we like in that. All right, so the overall side at the top is going to look something like this. But remember, it's going to be covered with spines because the ones I have for you were killed and preserved. So they were not bleached out. So they still have their spines. And we can scratch, scratch some of the spines off. It gets a little messy. But we can do that and try to find our little, um, our little holes in there. So it says here, what do they call them, lunules? going through the body. That helps them to dig through the, the sand, you know, and not be stuck there. Um, the petaloids for the flower thing, and then our food grooves right here, the mouth on the bottom right here. So we'll be looking for all of these things in our uh, uh, dissection. Um, here's what we're gonna find on the top. So I'm gonna give you instructions on how to try to dissect this where we can see all this stuff. Okay, we're gonna try to take the top of the sand dollar off. All right, we're gonna try that. We'll see how it works. We may have to share scissors in this deal. And we should be able to see uh, the stomach and the gut, maybe. We'll, but we'll definitely find the mouth parts, for sure. So if we can find what's connected to the mouth parts, we'll know that's the stomach. And maybe find all of these things right here. I think your book's going to have some things. Before we move on, remember our sandworms? We already dissected those guys. This is some sort of creepy show. Do you all know what show that is? I don't know. It's a creepy show, but then here, I just wanted to show you this creepy sandworm right there. I don't know, another show, right. All right, so that's it for the lecture, and now we're going to start the lab. Let's go back to that um, so we can try to find those things. Okay.